morning, everyone. My name is David Faber, and today is Sunday, August 23rd, the 12th Sunday after Pentecost. It's been a while since I've actually helped to lead worship here. Uh, I was looking back at my notes and my calendar, and I think it was about this time last year uh, that I was here. Obviously not doing the pre-recorded thing. Uh, that was in person, and I must admit I certainly have missed you all, and I have missed um, not coming to a regular service, as it were. But this is a wonderful way for us all to continue to be connected and share in that love that we have uh, of God and, and of Jesus. Before I get started, I encourage you to light a candle if you have one. We've lit the Christ candles and uh, uh, here today. And if you're able to do that at home before we start or before you start, you can pause the video do that and then join us and we share in that light and that heat that energy that is released for all so please join me in our call to worship this is a place of refuge a place where we can be together within the spirit but this is not a place where we can hide because we are called to faithful service we pause briefly to refresh our souls so that we may refresh the soul of creation. Let us worship God. We continue with our opening prayer. Glorious life giver, you offer such astounding beauty. Lakes, fields, hillsides, birds and wildlife exist in harmony, bringing diversity to the environment. We are all part of your glorious creation. Thank you for gracing us with such beautiful and wonderful abundance. Help us to treasure and care for your good creation day by day. As we do so, may we be filled in great gratitude and wonder. Amen. And we continue with our opening hymn, Voices United, number 412, This is the Day, sung by the Ensemble. This is the day, this is the day that our God has made, that our God has made. We will rejoice, we will rejoice. And
So thank you for that wonderful song. I am so full of happiness and joy for the music and you're going to hear a little bit about the theme today as we go through worship and it touches upon water. But as part of water, what flows out of you but song? And so that flowing of song is a connection that we all have as well. Our scripture reading today is from Exodus chapter 1 verses 8 to chapter 2 verses 10 and it's a story we all know it's a story that I know I'll, I'll share a little bit in the reflection but of growing up with growing up with it and watching it unfold through different movies in particular spending time with my cousins and watching it on TV with them now a new king arose over Egypt, who did not know Joseph. He said to his people, Look, the Israelite people are more numerous and more powerful than we. Come, let us deal shrewdly with them, or they will increase, and in the event of war, join our enemies and fight against us and escape from the land. Therefore they set taskmasters upon them to oppress them with forced labor. They built supply cities, Pithom and Ramses, for Pharaoh. But the more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied and spread, so that the Egyptians came to dread the Israelites. The Egyptians became ruthless in imposing tasks on the Israelites and made their lives bitter with hard service in mortar and brick and in every kind of field labor. They were ruthless in all the tasks that were imposed on them. The king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives, one of whom was named Shephira, and the other, Pua. When you act as midwives to the Hebrew women and see them on the birth stool, if it is a boy, kill him. But if it is a girl, she shall live. But the midwives feared God. They did not do as the king of Egypt commanded them, but let the boys live. So the king of Egypt summoned the midwives and said to them, Why have you done this and allowed the boys to live? The midwives said to Pharaoh, Because the Hebrew women are not like the Egyptian women, for they are vigorous and give birth before the midwife comes to them. So God dealt with the midwives and with the people, therefore multiplied and became very strong. And because the midwives feared God, he gave them families. Then Pharaoh commanded all his people, Every boy that is born to the Hebrews you shall throw in the Nile, but you shall let every girl live. Now a man from the house of Levi went and married a Levite woman. The woman conceived and bore a son, and when she saw that he was a fine baby, she hid him three months. When she could hide him no longer, she got a papyrus basket for him and plastered it with bitumen and pitch. She put the child in it and placed it among the reeds on the bank of the river. His sister stood at a distance to see what had happened to him. The daughter of Pharaoh came down to bathe at the river, while her attendants walked beside the river. She saw the basket among the reeds and sent her maid to bring it. When she opened it, she saw the child. He was crying, and she took pity on him. This must be one of the Hebrews' children, she said. Then his sister said to Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and get you a nurse from the Hebrew women to nurse the child for you? Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Yes. So the girl went and called the child's mother. Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Take this child and nurse it for me, and I will give you your wages. So the woman took the child and nursed it. When the child grew up, she brought him to Pharaoh's daughter, and she took him as her son. She named him Moses, because she said, I drew him out of the water. God grant us understanding of these and all lessons from the Holy Scripture. Amen. So with that setting or that backdrop, we move into the reflection. And it's one that I spent quite a bit of time talking about and wanted to share some personal stories 
about it and the significance of it and also talk to the significance of it in all of our lives and that is water of life the water that keeps us all here and present without it we wouldn't be here i mean obviously it's critical to our survival we can live for several weeks without food but if you go more than four days your body starts to shut down our body weight itself is 65 to 75 percent water so we are truly a water people. And of course, water is very symbolic to the creation of life and of course, very literal. When you're born, the water that is released, you know, it encompasses you actually while you're in your mother's womb, surrounding you, looking after you, ensuring you're safe, you're warm. There's so many different aspects of it in our lives that we look to and that the church does. I'll share some of those stories with you. Of course, our scripture focuses, as I was kind of dropping there a little hint, it focuses on Egypt and Exodus. As I mentioned, I remember growing up and spending time with my cousins around Easter and we'd always watch the different movies and of course my favorite, and I was trying to remember the name, it just doesn't come to me right now, but from the mid-50s late 50s when it was first colorized and we would watch the story of the Exodus and of Moses freeing the Israelites leading them to Israel parting of the Red Sea and all that comes with it all of those stories that we now know of course perhaps you don't know where the term Levite comes from and there's of course a lot of history that we learn as we go through and you study the scriptures. Well, Levi was the third son of Jacob, and so comprised, and there are 12 sons of Jacob, and those all comprise different tribes in Israel, and there's descendants that trace all their roots back to this. They were teachers, they were musicians, administrators, guards, porters, and of course that very famous of Levite, Moses himself. So his parents come together and they give birth at this time. It must have been very challenging. You have Pharaoh saying to everyone, if you bear a child and it's a boy, then you've got to kill it on the spot. Just think of that as a backdrop. As to the place that you're living in and this is what you're being told and you'll go to prison and perhaps even be killed yourself if you don't follow through with the rules and people resist it as in scripture says the midwives wouldn't do it to take life that has just been born and is part of God's world to take it so quickly and so the parents of this young boy who's born they Put together some reeds and obviously line it so that it doesn't sink in the water and place the child in the basket and I don't know if that was really a tributary of the Nile or it was the Nile itself it's somewhere I'd love to travel sometime and go and experience and actually see the Nile for myself but he's placed in this basket and floats down the river and there is the daughter of Pharaoh bathing and comes across this child in the water and lifts the child up and something obviously must have pulled at her to not just let the child float down. She surely knew that it was an Israelite child that was meant to be killed and she takes pity and she realizes that no, there's something here. I just, I can't let this child go. I can't see this child killed and she takes it and gives it to someone to look after until the child grows up and becomes a young man who is then brought back forward to her and presented to her as Moses. I never realized that the name Moses came from, I drew him out of water. That's all so fitting and obviously it makes sense. And maybe I missed something in my Sunday school teachings or youth group where I didn't get to see that. I missed it. I wasn't listening as intently as perhaps I should have. 
but I drew him out of water. That life out of water, that symbolic nature of what's being presented to us can be taken in so many ways. I've always been fascinated by water and I wanted to share some stories. I grew up with a mother who was really into swimming, synchronized swimming, in competition swimming, distance swimming. She was a lifeguard and all sorts of things and I followed down her path. Of course, being very young, I remember being dunked in the water and taught how to swim. She would pick me up and zoom me back and forth. I did that with my own sons as they grew up. So I have a real love of water and being part of it. And I thought, well, yeah, that's a, a common one, you know, going swimming or something like that. What about some stories of water in a different way? Ice fishing. So we would go and spend time, obviously in the winter time, we'd get together as a family. And if you've never been ice fishing, it's something that I encourage you to try. It's something that truly is Canadian. I talk to my friends in the States and sometimes they're astounded that what, you take your truck and you just drive it out onto the ice and you don't die? <laughs> There's that aspect of going out somewhere that this doesn't feel normal. <laughs> Maybe it feels normal enough to me, I've done it enough times, but when you first drive a vehicle out onto the lake, it, might, it gives you a little start. And certainly if you hear the ice crack a little bit under the weight of the vehicle, and it's just settling, it's fine. It gives you a start. Then we would drive out and clear an area of snow off the lake and then we'd get the auger out. And our family, we never had one of those powered augers. I was always envious of families that had the powered auger where you start it up with a gas engine and it cuts right down through it. No, we had the old hand crank type. You remember those? And we would dig in through the ice and I don't know, I remember taking us half an hour. We'd be starving after we'd eaten some kind of chocolate or candies after we finished digging that through. And that moment of when the auger was always kind of scary in a way because you didn't want to drop the auger down through the ice. And you could if you were pushing those smaller ones. The handle sometimes would catch on the side if you dropped it, but sometimes it wouldn't. You'd auger down and you'd feel that moment where it breaks through and the water comes rushing up and it fills that hole. Clear out all the ice and Take that fishing tent, and if you haven't seen a fishing tent for ice fishing, it's basically like a normal tent but with no bottom. And you place that on top. You get out your little jig. And certainly for people who have never experienced ice fishing, when you go out on a boat on a normal lake that's thawed, you cast out your hook and you reel in and you're going around in a boat or off the shore. You don't really see what's going on. Maybe you have sonar or something in your boat so you can see approximately where the fish are. But it's different when you're ice fishing. You look down this hole and you literally can see, because you're enclosed in this dark space, you can see right down to the bottom. And you're able to see all the fish swimming underneath if you've picked the right spot. And that's what makes it exciting. I was talking with one person who'd never gone ice fishing. I said, how can you stare down a hole for so long? It's the anticipation. When you're looking down this hole and you know you can see the fish and you can see your hook and whatever bait you have on the hook and the fish is coming up to it and you're jigging away hoping that it'll bite and then it just passes it by. Something didn't trigger it. It didn't feel right to it. We'd often go kind of nearer to shore and you try to catch perch as you're closer to shore, if we go further out, maybe 40 or 50 feet deep, we try to fish for walleye. Sometimes we'd catch a jack or a pike. I'm not as fond of those fish from, from an eating standpoint, so I'd always be excited when I caught a walleye and slightly disappointed when I caught a jackfish. It was fun, you know, that and I never really appreciated what the water did. And there you are on top of the water looking down, being part of it. Or certainly skiing, I think I've shared stories of going skiing with my sons in the mountains and the joy that that brings. Being able to stand on top and look out. And if it weren't for water, we wouldn't be doing that. We take it for granted. We sometimes are frustrated by it. It's raining, it's snowing. I could keep on with that song. I won't do it to you. Or that early morning, morning dew in the spring. Growing up, 
on the farm and seeing that through the trees as it burns off as the sun comes out. So water. It's important for our bodies. Without it, you wouldn't be able to regulate your body temperature. Water protects our tissues and our joints. It removes toxins from our body. It improves your blood circulation and boosts your energy. Often I find with my own kids and whoever else, they start complaining about a headache. My first question is, have you drank enough water? It is that life-giving element for all of us. And we have many different symbols of water, not only in scripture and what's referenced there, but other symbols of water, such as baptism, our baptismal font, and how special that is, that sign of the water, that blessed water, that holy water, a cleansing, a recognition of new life or older life, being welcomed into our congregation, that family with God, in that trust we have with Jesus, that it's part of us. That we're there to remind, remind ourselves that we are loved and to be embraced. That covenant, the covenant we have with God and the covenant that God has with us, an affirmation of our place as part of this congregation, of how we all come together and how special it is. It's so important to remember. So perhaps this week as you work through, and I know we've had a number of hot days, remind yourself of the importance of water in our lives. However that is, maybe taking a walk down to the North Saskatchewan River. Walk along some paths, look out, and watch that water as it moves past. And be silent in that. And just listen. Just be present to it. In the name of the Lord, our God, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. So we continue with our prayers, and so I ask that you bow your head in prayer. Oh God, thank you for today. Thank you for this moment that we're in and the blessings of this world to us at a time that can be so difficult and challenging. So much information coming to us all the time the fear that it can bring. We pray for our families, and those families with, with children who are going to school and that nervousness, that trepidation of our most precious, precious parts of our family going back to something that they need to go back to, to see their friends and spend time and to continue to learn Yet there's that fear that's lingering. We pray to God to release that anxiety, to pay attention and mindful, but to try and release that anxiety, just even for a little bit. We pray for those that are on the streets and are challenged in their lives and maybe don't get enough water in their life and struggle with addictions and crime, those that are incarcerated, we pray for them. We pray for our families that are traveling and that they come back safely and are ready to step into what comes forward to us. We welcome everyone into our hearts. And we pray humbly for ourselves that we find that trust, that faith, that love in Jesus. And we know that God is with us and we only need to spend a quiet moment to make that reconnection. 
We pray for that grace in our lives. And we pray in silence. Continue to pray together in the prayer that Jesus has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. So I would encourage you, if you're new to our congregation or you're just watching this online, if you're able to contribute financially to the support of the church, and what our congregation does, all the fantastic work that we do, there's a lot of investment that's going into technology so that we can continue to provide these worship services in a way that connects in a more meaningful way, where the audio is clear, the video is better. A lot of investment goes into that. So if you're already on par or you're able to donate, please do so. You can go to our website, just search up Riverbend United, Edmonton. It'll come up and there's a donate button. And please donate and help out the church and our congregation and the good work that we all do. Caring God, may we offer not only our material gifts, but our whole selves to you. And to all those who need our support in the quest for justice, we ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. So we continue with our closing hymn in Voices United, number 371, Open My Eyes That I May See, again led by the ensemble.
So thank you. Thank you for today and spending that time with us. I'm very appreciative of our congregation. I've continued to do different services for different churches throughout Edmonton. And it's so meaningful to be able to come back and so humbling to be able to spend this time with you and help lead and worship and, and just be present. So don't forget about that water and what it means to you. Spend that time this week and just ask just a little bit in whatever meaningful way that is for you and share that gratitude back in prayer. May the grace of God, deeper than our imagination, the strength of Christ, stronger than our need, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, richer than our togetherness, guide and sustain us today and in all our tomorrows, in love and in light. Amen. Give it the